know that virtual coaching has become more competitive than ever. NASM's got you covered with our virtual coaching course. NASM's virtual coaching course provides a complete solution to help you translate your services into a successful virtual platform. This course will give you the tools to build and operate a sustainable virtual business model. The formats may be different, but you're still delivering fitness training and effective behavioral coaching. That doesn't change even if you can't be in the same physical space as your clients. The truth is, this is the way to reach more clients and expand your reach and impact. There's never been a better time to carve out your very own virtual space, and NASM is here to help. Welcome to NASM's Virtual Coaching. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Strong Mind, Strong Body podcast. I'm your host, Angie Miller, and today we are going to talk about fear, that ugly beast. We are going to talk about, are you letting fear call the shots and how to stop letting fear get in the way? So I have a courage expert known as Margie Worrell, and she is a best-selling author, and she loves to talk about fear and how to rethink our fears and go ahead and go after those risks. So I'm going to go ahead and just introduce you to Dr. Margie, Margie Worrell and let her say hello. Hi, thank you, Angie. It's awesome to be with you today. All right. So, you know, Margie, you are the author of many books and your latest book. I really, really enjoyed. I took a deep dive into that book and I hope that you'll mention it and talk about it. But one of the things that really, really struck me is you talk so much about confidence and doubting our doubts. And I think that there's so much to be said for this, what I call this narrative that we we pick up when we're young, things like these, this inner critic that we hear these messages and that we replay them over and over again in our mind. And I think what happens is I explained to my my clients personally that sometimes things will happen to you in life and 50 good things might happen, but then one bad thing might happen and it supports that narrative that you grew up believing. And it's like, that's the one thing that you latch on to because maybe you grew up and you said, you know, I've never been good at science or I've never been good at math or I'm not going to be successful or I'm not a good business person and whatever supports that narrative we latch on to. So I would just love to hear you talk about doubting your doubts. Let's let's start with that. Yeah, well, look, I think it's important to realize your thoughts may be real, but what you're telling yourself isn't necessarily true. And so often we we have this inner narrative, this I call it doubt FM playing in our head 24-7. You know, you're not good enough, or what if you fail, or what if you fall? And we get we treat it as though it's the truth. You know, you're not smart enough, you're never going to be able to succeed at this, etc. And we buy into that narrative and we act from that narrative. And it's important to recognize that we have many biases, many of the what we call unconscious cognitive biases, things that we don't even realize that we do. And so we are wired for safety. You're not wired for happiness. You're not wired for blazing brave trails. You're actually wired to protect your sense of safety and security. And while these days we don't have to worry about, you know, being eaten by a, a saber-toothed tiger, we treat the environment around us as though our very existence is under threat often. And so that little voice of doubt is there to keep us safe. It doesn't want you putting yourself out there dreaming really big about creating an amazing life because then you put yourself at risk of falling short. And so often without realizing it, we let our fears, our fear of what we don't want to happen, our fear of loss, our fear of looking foolish, of failing, of feeling inadequate, or being exposed as a fraud, we let that fear sit in the driver's seat of our lives and it calls the shots. And we're not even, we often don't even recognize where fear is at play. We think of it as, oh, oh, well, you know, 
big, big things, but actually even in the little conversations we have every day, uh, whether to reach out to someone, whether to, you know, risk a rejection or risk someone saying no or not getting what we want. So often in these little micro moments, our fear keeps us from taking the very actions, Angie, that would help us to be become more confident, to be braver and to to have that to create the success we want. Absolutely. And you know, it's funny that you in your book, you described it perfectly. You said fear is kind of fear shows up in a lot of ways. Fear shows up as procrastination. Fear shows up as, oh, you named all these different things that it shows up as sometimes even kind of pompousness or entitlement. But uh, so many times we put things off and I think that's from a deep seated place of fear. But fear shows up in so many different ways, so many different nuances. And uh, you mentioned that in your book and I'd love for you to kind of talk about yeah. that for a minute. What 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 is that exactly? Yeah, well, look, yeah, and I wrote about this in, in my latest book, You've Got This. Um, and the subtitle of that book is The Life-Changing Power of Trusting Yourself. And so often we operate from our doubts and our fears and not from a faith, a belief that I've got this. I can figure this out. I don't know all the answers and I don't know all the steps along the way. But one day at a time, one hour at a time, one minute at a time, one conversation at a time, I can figure it out. And so, yeah, you just you just ask, you know, what are the ways that fear can show up? Well, to anyone watching, I would invite you to think about, well, which areas of my life am I not able to give myself at least an eight or nine out of 10? It may be in money. It may be in relationships. It may be in how you're feeling about building, going after your goals. It may be that you're just like, ah, you're feeling a bit ho-hum and your doubts are constantly, constantly calling those shots. And if I was going to say, well, what's getting in the way of you changing that, of making it better? My guess is you would tell me your reason. It'd be an ex it'd be, you know, maybe it's a very good reason. Maybe it's like, well, I haven't got time, or you know, this person's a terrible person, or or whatever. But underneath all of that will be a story that has got fear in it in some way. And it's why, in order for us to be as successful as we want professionally, as a trainer, in any in your work, but any area of life, we have to be continually challenging our own thinking. And really peeling back the layers and looking at, you know, what is it that I'm really afraid of here that I'm scared that if I do this or change this, that that this that this is going to be the fallout. I don't want to face it. And, and I think so many people, when you peel back enough of the layers, is this deep-rooted fear of not being enough, good yeah. enough, smart enough, worthy enough, des des de deserving enough loving enough, lovable enough, whatever. And so often it really can undermine our ability to thrive in ourselves, but also to make the impact we want to make for others. Those who have, are watching this now, you know, they're passionate around physical fitness and wellness and helping others to in, enjoy that sense of strength and vitality. And, and yet so often our fear of, of not looking great or feeling bad about ourselves gets in the way of us doing maximum good for others. Yeah, I call it, and I love the way you said peeling away the layers, because I do think that when we do peel away the layers, we do need to get to that inner narrative. And I call it uh, calling fears bluff. So if you were to call fears bluff, what's worst case scenario? What are you really actually scared of? And what's the worst thing that could happen if you went after whatever it is that you want to go after? You know, and worst case scenario is never as bad as not even taking a chance in the first place. And so I think that you're right about that. It's, it's getting to the underbelly of what is it that you fear? What is it that you're so scared of? Because chances are it's not nearly as scared as scary as those regrets that you might have if you don't go after it. Yeah. So often we reject ourselves before anyone else can. And we fail far more from timidity, from not daring to try than we do from actually trying and falling short. And, you know, there's some so much great research in this, but when we take a chance, when we put ourselves out there, when we go, you know what, I'm going to do the very thing I'm terrified of doing, when we do that, we often find that actually um, 
the very things that we thought were going to be so terrifying aren't as scary as we thought. And we go, you know what? That wasn't so bad. You know, the ground didn't open up. I didn't fall to my death. Last year, uh, this time a year ago, actually, my husband got COVID. I was living in Singapore. I'm now back living in the USA. And he got he got COVID. He had to go to hospital. I had a book tour that was launching. And I decided, look, you know, my fear kind of welled up. And I was feeling kind of overwhelmed. And I had to just get, okay, what's going, what's what's the bravest response I can have here? So I, I'm on Facebook and, and, and obviously all the social media, and I just decided I would just get on social media and share my journey. He ended up away for 30 days. And by simply like really getting present to my own fear and deciding I'm not going to let fear keep me from showing up in the bravest way I can in this moment when I'm feeling so vulnerable, it empowered me. I actually think I probably never felt as empowered in my life as I did during those moments when I was feeling so overwhelmed and also so vulnerable. And mm-hmm. it speaks to the fact that when you do the very, when you, you're in that moment of feeling afraid and you decide, I am not going to let my fear stop me from speaking up, showing up, being the person I really want to be, even though I'm not feeling as brave as I want to be, I'm going to act as though I am, it actually emboldens us for bigger things. So, you know, Margie, what really, what I loved in your book, probably my favorite part, and it came to me at the perfect time, was I read the part in your book where you talked about how you don't have to know exactly where you're going. You don't have to know exactly where you're going to end up. You don't have to wait for all the circumstances to be perfect. You just have to agree and settle with yourself that you're not going to stay where you are and you're going to take that first step. And that spoke to me because I hosted my very first women's retreat this past weekend and I knew it was coming and I had been waiting for all the steps to fall into place and me to know exactly what A through Z was going to be in the alphabet. And another friend had basically just told me the same thing that I had read in your book. And then I read it again and thought, you know what? This is coming to me for a reason. Yeah, awesome, awesome. You know, it's funny, Ange, I started running my own women's weekends. I wouldn't call them retreats about six years ago. And I remember when I I felt inspired to do it, but I remember thinking I've never done this before. It was like my own public sort of weekend. And the voice in my head was like, you know, there's so many people out there who are experts in this or that or the other. And in the end, I thought, you know what? I feel called to do this. I'm just going to do it. And even though I don't know exactly what I'm doing, and I'm going to give myself permission to not do it perfectly in the marketing for the weekend to look back and go, you know what? I would have done more of this or less of this, et cetera. And I'm sure for you, when you look back at the end, you go, well, I might have scheduled it a little bit differently. I might have structured it a little bit more of this or a little bit less of that. But you cannot know that unless you've done it. And so often we want to get to the point that we know everything. We've got the mastery without actually having gone through the doing. And we learn so much more from doing than we ever can from simply studying it or planning for it or preparing for it. And so the only way we can ever really become masterful in anything is by giving ourselves permission to start where we are and to get better as we go along and to iterate and to discover what works and what doesn't work, et cetera, et cetera. And I see so many people, whether it's working as coaches, whether it's in any domain actually, but I often see it with people who are wanting to start their own business or go out and do something that they feel really inspired to do and and feeling like, oh, but I don't know what I'm doing. I need to be as good as that. I need to be like Tony Robbins before I do my first you know, personal empowerment event, et cetera. I'm like, he had to start somewhere too. And so just start where you are because you have value to add right now. You People will benefit from what you know right now. And that doesn't mean there's not a whole lot more you can learn, but right now you have enormous value. And I think the more we give ourselves permission to not do something like perfectly first time every time it actually allows us to be in action and it's while we're in action that we're learning 
Yes, absolutely. And I think that if I had waited for all the chips to fall into place, I would have never, ever done it. And I did hire some coaching and I would recommend that anybody out there who you just can't take that leap of faith, hire a good coach, hire a good mentor, somebody to work with you, somebody to remind you everything that you're saying, Margie. And again, I'm talking to Margie Worrell and she is a courage expert and she just wrote the book, You Got This. And that's what this is all about is just calling fears bluff and getting fear out of the driver's seat and say, you know what, move over. I need to try some things, but I couldn't agree with you more. And this is what my coach had said. And this is what a good friend of mine had said, you know, you have to stop trying to control all the variables. And this is what I talk to my clients about in mental health, trying to control all the variables, trying to predict this outcome and this outcome and this outcome. And what if this, and what if that, and you can't control the variables because you don't even know what they are yet. It yeah. wasn't until I hosted this retreat that I knew what I was up against or that I knew what the obstacles were going to be or that I knew what my successes were going to be. You just absolutely have to step out. It's like it's like taking that first step into water. You're not on solid ground anymore. And, uh, and you just have to go with that. You have to kind of have a little bit of that sinking feeling, but yet it's a bit of a floating feeling as you start to go into it and feel successful. And so as the day went on and the retreat went on, I picked up momentum and speed and courage awesome. and that's what it took that's like blood running through my my veins of saying okay now you know for next time so yeah. i would encourage anybody out there who's who's kind of right on the edge of all these doubts and all these fears the only way you're ever really going to know is to put yourself out there and take that first step and and there's there's nothing I, to me there is no failure except for the failure of not trying not yeah. taking a risk on yourself yeah, I think something, and I and I wrote about this in, in You've Got This, if you've got a doubt, there's something you want to do and you haven't been doing it. You know you've been making very, very good quality excuses and, and rationalizations because let's face it, if you're looking for excuses, you'll always find them. But play this tape forward, play it forward. Okay, so you stick with that reason, you stick with that doubt. One year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, how are you going to feel about yourself and your life if you keep on that default path that you're on right now? And often we discount the cost of letting our doubts call the shots, of not taking those actions and defying our doubts. And so get present, put yourself in the shoes of your future self five years from now. And think about it. How will I feel if I stay, stick with this reason, if I stick letting this doubt is, 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 is sitting there in that driver's seat? And the chances are you're going to go, you know what, I'm going to feel pretty, pretty crappy about myself. I'm not going to feel great. Well, then ask yourself, okay, if I was in action and I was continually defying that doubt right now, how will I feel even one year from now because I've dared to try and you will just by just imagining it, you'll go, you know what? I just feel more empowered because I have backed myself here. And so often when we think about taking an action, our doubts kick in and we focus more on what could go wrong and on what we could lose versus what could go right and what we could gain. In fact, right. our brains are twice as sensitive to potential losses as they are to potential gains. Right. And so just you know, consult with your future self if you take, you know, current default course of action or brave course of action. And, you know, therein is, is often a very powerful motivator. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I talk a lot about how so many times we focus on what's what, what's not working instead of what is working or what could go wrong versus what could go right. And so it's all about reframing. And they teach that a lot in cognitive behavioral therapy, just a simple reframe. When you notice yourself saying what could go wrong, force yourself to say for every two things that I say could go wrong, I have to reframe that and I have to name two things that could go right. And for every time that I focus on you know, my doubts and fears, I have to name a couple of things that I could gain from being courageous. And so I do think that there's a lot of cognitive processes that need to happen in our own head. We need to be able to call our own bluff and we need to be able to call ourselves out and say, I'm not allowed just to talk about the negative. I have to give myself a reframe. Even if I don't completely believe it or buy into it, how do we build confidence? Well, we fake it till we make it. Right. So we have to shift that narrative in our head and keep saying it over and over again and, and call our own bluff. Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's some great research that shows that you might not really believe you can do it, 
So change your action and then let your belief catch up. Like first do, <laughs> mm-hmm. first do, and then and then believe. And I, I I write for Forbes, and I but I wrote about this in my book too. I did a column on that. First do, then believe. Change your action, but don't think I have to go out there and do something massively big. Just start with something small, small incremental changes. Just like going to the gym, right? If you haven't, someone hasn't worked out for five years ever, and they go and they try and lift five pounds, they're like, oh, it's it's hard, it's uncomfortable. They're sore the next day. They did ten squats, they're like, oh, I'm really sore. Go back the next day. Go back the next day. So it's about train the brave, training the brave part of us taking the actions even though you might not feel confident even though you might not feel brave but if you do that every day just something small you know i'm going to go up and talk to someone i don't know i'm going to just make conversation with someone in the line at at the coffee shop i'm going to just something that for you is a little bit uncomfortable but but it's definitely a stretch it's a little bit uncomfortable but it's not maybe terrifyingly uncomfortable the next day becomes less so and less so and less so and less so. And we build up that courage muscle, that confidence muscle. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, first chapter of this book is, is you know, don't wait for confidence. <laughs> Do not wait until you're sure that you're not going to fail or that you're sure that you have all the answers before you start. Right. Just start small and train the brave. There's never going to be a perfect time for anything. If we think back, even when we decided to have kids, was it the perfect time to have kids? Was it, you know, nothing in our lives ever happened at the perfect time. Generally things happen as they're meant to happen. And as we're willing to put ourselves out there, we're only going to get the reward as much as we're willing to go after the risk. And you actually say in your book, action is the antidote to fear. Mm -hmm. And I do think that, that we, our fears are fabricated fears are so much bigger than anything that actually comes to fruition when we put our plan into action. So my fabricated fears about my virtual women's retreat didn't even hold a candle to any um, resemblance of fear that I had when I was actually doing it. So action truly is the antidote. It's like worrying and worrying and worrying about taking your um, CPT exam or worrying and worrying and worrying about taking your CES exam. But the minute you take action and you start studying and you delve into that first chapter, you're building a little bit of confidence. And then you read the second chapter. Now you're a little bit more confident because you're doing more and more action toward whatever it is that you want. It's what we tell our kids to do, but sometimes we struggle with that whole action piece of the the equation of going after what we want. Yeah, and I'm just recognizing that it is actually physically uncomfortable. Sometimes we can feel nausea in our belly or our chest is tight or our throat is dry. You know, there's there's physical fear manifests in the body. It constricts us in some way. And that's not fun. No one enjoys that. You don't go, oh, yeah, I love feeling really sick in my stomach and having my legs shake. So really as you notice yourself feeling nervous or feeling that that vulnerability, that sick feeling, whatever it is, embrace that. Instead of going, oh, I don't want to feel this, embrace that. Interpret that as a sign of you are growing into your potential. Oh, you know, I do a lot of keynote speaking and it's been virtual over the last year, but being when I go out and speak at conferences and sometimes there's several thousand people in the audience and some of the times I've been at places where you know they're 90% PhDs or they're you know incredible I've been at NASA or whatever you know people that are incredibly accomplished sometimes CEO audiences and there's a part of me that's like oh, you know my stomach's feeling nervous who am I to be on that stage that imposter syndrome and I'll say you know what I have everything it takes an enormous value to add here And so I know I'm growing into my own greatness by stepping confidently onto that stage. So taking that big, deep fear, feeling into it, but then connecting with that brave part and going, you know what? It's not about me. It's about what I can give. And so to anyone that finds themselves caught up in that, you know, embrace those uncomfortable feelings in your body and then put your focus onto what is it that you want, not on what you don't want. What do you want to give versus on what do you get? You know, what's the value you have to bring to others? And it can really shift the mental, emotional, spiritual and physical place that you're in.
Yeah, I love that. I love that. Really putting your mind and your body, your whole physicality, your whole emotional body into focusing on what you want instead of what you don't want. And like I said, offering those reframes. So every time you give an argument for why it won't work, you have to reframe and give an argument for why it will. And one of the things, you know, before we kind of close up our show here, I want to talk about is at the beginning, I talked about that inner narrative, that inner critic, that we get these ideas in our mind when we're kids and and uh, we we pick up things in the world that people say or do in response to us. And it, and often we'll latch on to whatever supports that narrative. So if 50 people say a compliment to us, but one person says something that gets into our deep seated fear and supports that critic, we hold on to that as if that is the truth. And you talk a little bit about that in your book and you talk about questions we can ask ourselves to kind of, um, to kind of call the bluff on that inner critic. And one of them is one of the first questions you talked about is just ask yourself, is it true? And, and it goes into, is there evidence to support that it's true? You know, what, what evidence do we have to support that this critic has actually been, um, has, has taken you in dark places? Because if you're considering this next step, you must have been successful somewhere to believe in yourself enough to even consider it. And I often remind people of that. We don't even consider dreams and goals unless somewhere deep inside of us, we have some burning desire and we feel like we're worthy of that dream or goal. Um, so I, I love those questions. Do you have anything you kind of want to add to that about the questions we can ask ourselves to, to, yeah, well, you know. and just, I think you're right. We often hone in. I mean, we are Teflon for good and Velcro for bad, you know, someone yeah. person says one good thing and we like, Oh, you know, I'm We feel terrible, but 20 people can say you're awesome. And we're like, Oh yeah, whatever, you know? And we, so like, let the good stuff sink in. And instead, you know, when someone's you get negative feedback or something doesn't land the way you want, instead of kind of internalizing that and treating that as though it's the truth, look for evidence that contradicts it. And I think we actively need to be out there looking for the evidence that actually goes against the negative thoughts that we have. Because our brains are often on alert and we can, you know, if you're looking for red in your environment, you're going to hone in on all the red. Well, actively look for green, you know, and I think go out there and be so mindful and intentional about what you're putting your attention on because what we put our attention on expands, what you focus on expands. And if all you're doing is focusing on what you can't do, what you got wrong, who didn't like you or love you, then you're just magnifying that in your own mind and that takes up a disproportionate amount of your energy and creativity. Instead, be deliberate. Who is it I want to help? What do I know? I've who have I helped before? What do I know I'm good at? And just get back on the horse and get in action. Yeah, I love that. I, I call that focus on what you're focusing on. And so, you know, sometimes if people come to me and they they don't like their boss or there's something that's not working and they list 30 reasons why they shouldn't like that person or why this isn't working. And I always say, you know, can you give me something that is working? And it, it, it always throws them off guard or, yeah. you know, can you tell me about what's good about this person? Because it's focused on what you're focusing on. If we're looking for bad in people, we're going to find bad in people. If we're looking for all of our faults, we're going to find our faults. So it's, yeah. it's what Whatever we're focused on the most is what we see, feel, and experience in our world. We support our own narrative based on where we put our energy. And I do believe in manifesting energy. And sometimes we just have to manifest that energy toward what we want. But I will tell you after doing this weekend, for all of you out there, again, you know, action is the antidote to fear. And the minute you take action, all of that fear dissipates and you realize that it wasn't anywhere near uh, warranted for what it, the, for the step that you took, right? Because we generally start small. So Margie Worrell, uh, you are the courage expert and the author of You Got This. And I really appreciate you being here today and talking about how we can get fear out of the driver's seat. And I look forward to having you back again in the near future. And one thing that I want to leave everybody with, I love what you said. You said, we are Teflon for good and Velcro for bad. So in other words, we let the bad stick and then we, we just don't let the good in. But I would encourage you to do the opposite. Be Velcro for the good and be Teflon for the bad, right? So thank Amen. you so much, uh, Marky. I really appreciate you being here. I hope everybody is well, and we will see you next time.